But he decided to create in secret without telling the world. In the third section of my book, we talk about um, a major scandal that uh, has consumed the, uh, not just the CRISPR community, but the whole scientific community. He Jiang Kui is a Chinese scientist who trained in the United States. After he returned to China to set up his own group, his own laboratory, uh, he was having a very successful career. But he decided that he would try to create human babies with an edited gene. He did this in secret without telling the world what he was planning or why he was planning to do it. In April 2018, he sent a email to one of his former colleagues in America to announce that one of the women in his experiment was now pregnant. The story was released by this journalist, Antonio Regalado, who works for a magazine called MIT Technology Review. In November 2018, He Jiang Kui presented his work at a conference in Hong Kong. There were more photographers and journalists in the audience than scientists. Journalists arrived from all over Asia and all around the world very quickly in order to hear this historic uh, presentation. As we learned more about what He Jiang Kui had done, the list of uh, criticisms and concerns grew longer and longer. Ed Yong is a journalist at The Atlantic who just won the Pulitzer Prize for his writing about COVID-19. One week after He Jiang Kui presented in Hong Kong, he wrote this magnificent uh, article in The Atlantic listing 15 reasons why what he did was a major concern, a major problem. In part three of my book, I spend a lot of time discussing all of these points, one, one to 15. I think the major problem is summarized in this quote from Che Renzong from China. I think you all understand this, but the criticism is that what He Jiang Kui did by changing the genes in a human embryo, that means that all of those changes can be passed on to that, ch that person's children and children and through X every generation. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm so happy that my book has been published in Korea. This is the first international edition of the book outside of the United States. I wanted to write a book about CRISPR because this new technology has become so important uh, around the world and, and is, such, is so powerful, as, as you know. Over the last five years, CRISPR has become maybe the most famous uh, and exciting story in science. This is a photograph of Feng Zhang, a scientist at the Broad Institute in Boston. He is being interviewed on the most famous news program on American television. It is called 60 Minutes. So when I saw this, I knew that CRISPR was not of interest, not just to scientists, but to a much larger public. And so I thought 
maybe now is the time to start uh, preparing, thinking about writing a book about CRISPR. CRISPR was also becoming exciting <laughs> to a much wider field. You know who this is. This is Dwayne Johnson, a famous uh, movie star, uh, at least certainly in America. And in this film called Rampage, he was fighting giant hybrid animals who had been mutated because of CRISPR. CRISPR was celebrated last year when the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to these two women, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. My book was published one day before the Nobel Prize announcement, so I did not know that uh, they were going to win. But in my book, in the photographs uh, at the back of the book, you see I give one page to Doudna and one page to Charpentier. So I thought it was likely that they would win one day. Usually the Nobel Prizes are presented in Sweden, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic, other arrangements had to be made. Emmanuel received her prize at the uh, Swedish Embassy in Berlin, Germany, and Jennifer Doudna received her medal in her back garden in Berkeley, California. She has a very nice back garden. There was a lot of um, debate and interest about who would win the Nobel Prize. Many people thought Feng Zhang, who I showed earlier, would be a winner. Two years ago, the another very famous prize called the Kavli Prize was presented to Charpentier, Doudna, and this scientist, Virgis Shixness. However, the Nobel Prize Committee decided not to award the Nobel Prize to Shixness. It was the first time in history that two women had shared the Nobel Prize for chemistry. The first uh, section of my book describes how CRISPR was discovered and how the gene editing technology was invented. The story shows the importance of funding basic research into fundamental biology because you never know what inventions may come from that work. When I was uh, a PhD student in London, we had never heard of CRISPR. We knew nothing about CRISPR. We knew of a family of enzymes in bacteria that bacteria use to defend themselves against viruses. They are called restriction enzymes. In 2000, 2005, 2007, scientists in Japan and Europe discovered CRISPR sequences in bacteria that we now know provide another critical important defense system against viruses. In nature, CRISPR provides a mechanism to specifically cut viral DNA at a specific DNA sequence. In my book, I interview many of the scientists who made these discoveries, including Francisco Mojica, who was the first scientist to identify that the CRISPR sequences are captured from viruses. Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, they did not know each other. But in 2011, they met and decided to form a collaboration between their groups. That resulted in this very famous paper published in Science Magazine in June 2012. This team had taken CRISPR and adapted it so that it could now cut any DNA sequence in any organism. And of course, it is for this work and this paper, this, this research publication, that Doudna and Charpentier won the Nobel Prize. 
A few years ago, a Japanese group uh, made this video of the enzyme in CRISPR called Cas9 cutting the DNA. Let's watch it. Here it comes. Thinking, thinking. Six months after the Doudna paper in Science, many groups showed that CRISPR could also cut and edit human DNA. They included Feng Zhang, who we saw earlier, George Church, who is a very famous scientist in Boston at Harvard Medical School, and Jin Su Kim, a uh, very famous uh, scientist from your country, who also showed in January 2013 that CRISPR-Cas9 could perform genome editing in human cells. In the second section of my book, I talk about the 30-year development of gene therapy. CRISPR is showing great promise as a tool to cure patients with terrible genetic diseases, including sickle cell disease. This lady is a woman named Victoria Gray from the United States. She is the first American patient with sickle cell disease to be cured using CRISPR. In the final section of the book, I look around the world and talk about some of the other applications of CRISPR, not just in medicine, but in agriculture and evolution, and even potentially recreating animals that have gone extinct. Here, for example, is George Church traveling in Siberia, where he is working with scientists in the hopes of uh, resurrecting or uh, recreating the woolly mammoth. The idea is that by editing some of the genes in the mammoth's nearest relative, the Asian elephant, maybe the creature that would result would have more properties that resembled the woolly mammoth. I also talk about uh, new versions of CRISPR, CRISPR 2.0, that can perform genome editing with even greater precision, greater specificity. The leader in this field is Professor David Liu from the Broad Institute. He has developed a new technology called base editing. Although it is very early days in this story. Base editing has already shown great promise in treating animal models for diseases including sickle cell disease and progeria. Progeria is a genetic disorder that results in premature early aging. That is a very quick summary of my book and once again I am so thrilled that Following the release last year in America, it is now published in Korea. And finally, there is a film, a documentary film, that covers much of the same ground as my book. It is called Human Nature. In America, you can find it on Netflix. It may be, may be somewhere else uh, available in Korea. But I highly, highly recommend you, you try to find this film. It is, it is wonderful. It is very, very good. So thank you for listening. And I'm really looking forward to your questions. I guess uh, begin by reading my book. <laughs> this is a big problem um, in the United States and around the world. So many people believe that vaccines are dangerous, that Bill Gates wants to inject nano robots into your blood. I think social media platforms like Facebook and YouTube are making this problem much, much worse. And it doesn't help that some politicians exploit 
this and now it seems nobody knows what is the truth anymore. The film, the insurrection last January, when a thousands of Donald Trump supporters stormed the United States Capitol. Today, there are some American politicians who say that was not an insurrection, they were tourists. So we have a big problem and we have to continue to tell stories to, so I can write a book, maybe you can write a story for a newspaper or make a film or make a YouTube video or record a podcast. There is a, a lot of misinformation about genetically modified food. Genetically modified food sounds scary, and it is not. Unfortunately, um, the public has been convinced that anything that is genetically modified is dangerous. Companies are taking advantage of this. Uh, in America, when you go to the supermarket, you see lots of labels on foods that say non-GMO, non-GMO. This includes items like water and salt. How can they be GMO? <laughs> As the question said, uh, gene editing is a little different because you do not leave any trace of the edited gene. Nothing is left behind. And we must accept and indeed encourage gene editing for crops and foods or otherwise millions of people on this planet will die of hunger. There is probably no more important crop on the planet than rice, and you know better than I do. Uh, with climate change, all of our foods are under constant growing danger from drought or pests or infectious agents. If we can use gene editing to make our uh, rice or oranges or apples or, or bananas more resistant to bacteria or parasites or fungi, then we, we absolutely have to do that. This is a great question because if I knew the answer, I would be writing a new book. Yeah, I nothing, nothing really that I can say. Um, I will give you two two answers. One is I'm reading that people are now taking gene editing instead of editing DNA, uh, they are trying to edit RNA. Maybe we will discover in the next 10 or 20 years that RNA editing is a more successful approach to treating diseases than genome editing. I think the other exciting area, which of course you have heard about, is artificial intelligence. I think AI will impact many aspects of society, including drug discovery but I am not going to write a book on AI. It's been a great delight to be part of your book club. Ah, 네, 제가 신규원 하면서 여러분들과 함께 좀더 좋은 시간을 보내고 어떻게 하면은 이렇게 성장하는 시간, 추억의 시간을 가질 수 있을까 많이 생각하던 중에 어, 케빈 데이비스 님이 저자분한테 직접 어, 이렇게 메시지를 보냈는데 흔쾌하게도 이렇게 허락을 해주셔서 어, 이렇게 오늘 이 자리를 마련하게 되었습니다. 어, 오늘 함께 해주셔서 정말 감사하고 그런 좋은 추억의 시간 함께 간직해서 정말 감사드립니다. 여기 우리 참관, 네, 카메라 꺼셨던 분들 모두 예, 카메라 켜주시고 체크, 네, 스테이, 원, 스테이. 네, 감사합니다. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much.